You're listening to the Stories Behind the Stars podcast. My name is Tatiana Fallon, and I'm your host. This podcast is run by the organization Stories Behind the Stars. This has nothing to do with Hollywood. We are telling the stories behind the stars that were given in World War II. For those of you who are not familiar, during World War II, when a service member was killed, the family received a banner with a gold star on it. We are telling the stories behind these stars. Our goal is to put them all 400,000 into a common database, which then we will build a smartphone app that will be searchable from any location where you can read the story behind the star and you can really come to know the individual that died on D-Day and fought for our freedoms or the individual who was doing their job on the home front and died in a plane crash. This podcast is dedicated to telling those stories as we find them, as our researchers are doing this amazing research. You'll hear from researchers who are all volunteers from all across the country, and you'll hear their story, what brought them to the project, and then also the stories that they're finding. This is amazing content, and I really hope you enjoy this adventure. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have Brian Fussfield. Um, all right, let's hear about William Dukeman. Oh, yeah, Bill, Bill Dukeman. So listeners may be familiar with William Dukeman. He was depicted in Band of Brothers as well. I'm sorry to keep bringing up Band of Brothers. Uh, I did have to write about a few of those those men as well, just through my, my nerdiness. But yeah, Bill Dukeman was a corporal in Easy Company of 2nd Battalion 506 and 101st, and he's shown in HBO series Band of Brothers. He was unfortunately killed during Operation Mark Garden um, on October 5th, I want to say, 1944 in the Netherlands. And uh, if you've ever seen the, the episode of Band of Brothers, Crossroads, his death is actually depicted in, in the show. And there's a few inaccuracies in the show about the man he was, how he was killed, everything that went down. And so I really like to clarify those things, specifically with like Band of Brothers guys or anybody that's been portrayed in popular media. I want to, I check the heck out of those facts if, if I can. And I really try to clarify the story. And uh, I do think we came up with some stuff, not that it's unique info, other well-versed airborne historians will know all this information too. I'm, I'm not some groundbreaking researcher. I just took the time to write the story about it. So yeah, Dukeman, um, he's from Colorado, uh, like myself. He, he was born outside of Denver and he was just a regular kid who joined up. He was looking for an adventure and um, wanted to be around the best, you know, have people he could trust to his left and his right excuse the cliche and so he joined the airborne and um yeah he was an original Tacoa man as they reference in band of brothers all the time he started training with easy company from the inception of it and as you know the or may, may not know the 506 parachute infantry they were an experimental unit they were the first of their kind and what made them so unique was in their formation their commanders were able to weed out who they wanted and who they didn't want, which is rare for U.S. Army units. A lot of commanders had to make do with the talent they were given. And because they were the airborne and new unit, through this original selection, he was one of the original U.S. paratroopers. He survived the Normandy campaign, um, made it back to England, survived the drop into Market Garden in the Netherlands. He, I think his birthday is also uh, in early October, so he had just turned 22 before he was killed. And um, he's well-liked amongst all the guys from top to bottom. And I've read memoirs from commanders of the 506 down to the privates who were re replacements later in the war. I, I want to know what kind of guy he was, like what his recreational stuff was, what his nickname was, what kind of cigarettes he liked. Like, those are the facts that I look for because that paints the human picture. And uh, yeah, Dukeman, you know, a staple easy company man. And he was one of the, he was the only man killed in that unit action showed in that episode, the, the crossroads, um, you know, when winters and a few guys are crawling along the dike near up the town of Uppusen, uh, Uppusen. I'm definitely saying that wrong. My bad <laughs> Dutch. And, um, yeah, he was killed by a rifle grenade by, by some Germans that were sort of hiding out behind his platoon, but he, he was killed leading his men, you know, he was standing while everybody else was lying in a ditch. He was up trying to get people moving out of danger. He was a corporal. So a, a lot of guys looked to him, he, even as a, a very, very um, junior NCO, he, a lot of guys were looking to him and he died bleeding. You know, he was 22. I'm, I'm 27. And, you know, I work my daily job all day. And 
to compare myself to what he was doing five years prior to where I am in age. It's crazy to me. And it's a Colorado guy like me and yeah, the type of things that really make you think. I think that's really kind of cool that you can grow up while watching these shows and like, you know, immersing yourself in this, this history and then have the opportunity to get to actually know the individual. Right. And yeah. that's one thing that I just, I really love about these stories is, is, you know, I, I did some research for a, a movie we made for D-Day and um, we researched a man, William, he climbed the cliffs on D-Day. Right. And so like when you think about, yeah, when I think about D-Day, now I think about, Oh, I, I have a friend who climbed the cliffs. Like I know he's not my friend. I know he doesn't know me. And, you know him. Yeah, but I know him, right? And I feel like yeah. I could say, like, oh, yeah, I know someone who climbed the cliffs on D-Day. I don't know someone. I mean, he doesn't know me. But, like, I just, I don't, I don't know. It, to me, I feel like as you research these person's lives, like, you get to know them and you feel like you know them. Like, you feel like even though you never met, that you still have a friend and you know somebody who was in easy company. Like, yeah. I don't know if and, that makes sense. It completely makes sense. It's exactly why I, I go after certain these certain guys like this. And I, I read a lot of stories on Colorado paratroopers because I, I understand the state history a little bit. And uh, I like to have, as I travel around the state, my various, you know, camping, hiking, skiing trips, whatever, uh, like, oh, wow, we're going, this is the town of Kenisburg. Like, this is where William Dupin was born in 21. Like, he, this is the, the views that he had of the mountains. He, he saw this view before he went to Europe. And like, I, I don't know, I know this is cheesy and, and abstract, but um, that's why I write about some of these guys. It, I, it's interesting to me because I do feel like it, it is cheesy. I mean, like <laughs> to think about, you know, they're standing at this man's grave and I was just like, you know, filming it because I've been working on this name and, yeah. you know, doing different things. It's like, I know you, that you died really young and you never really got to meet like and live a life, but I know you and thank you. Like, I, I don't know, it, it maybe it's cheesy, but I also feel like it's, it, it's honoring, but also like continuing. Yeah. It's just continuing yeah. their lives. Right. Exactly. It's making sure that what they did isn't just obliterated to historical dust. It's the only way maybe in some way that I can show gratitude towards what they did. Cause I, I can talk about it, you know, emotionally feel grateful, but the only, it doesn't make an impact as much as like actually putting some info out there that somebody could use one day and like they're therefore continue their, their memory. So it's the only way I can say thank you. Gets goosebumps sometimes when you do these researching, I feel like just cause it's, well, I don't stay up till 3am researching stuff on the internet from many things <laughs> other than this project. But yeah, which is by the way, when I get most of my work done for the project. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right, let's hear about um, John Halls. Uh, another Band of Brothers guy. I'm just going to go into Private First Class John B. Halls. Um, so also a Colorado-born paratrooper. He was born in 1922 in, in southwest Colorado, so in the mountains. Uh, he's a mountain guy. And um, his parents were actually Colorado pioneers, so some of the first people to be out here and, and settle the lands out here. So definitely a deeply rooted Colorado family. Um, and, you know, he... Uh, John D. Halls, he, I was able to find his childhood nickname, which was Dickie. And uh, he was a star basketball player on his, his high school team at Mancos High School in Colorado. Uh, he, he enlisted in the Army in 1942, and he, was, he volunteered for the Airborne. So not only did he volunteer to join the military, but he volunteered for the Airborne. He wanted to be tip of the spear. And so he was assigned to the new newly formed 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st. And uh, he was a mortar guy, so he was a he was a heavy mortar man. He they had the the regular, I want to say sixty millimeter mortars, and then they had the eighty one millimeters, which are like way in the back, kind of a, a specialty weapon that uh, battalion commanders would love to use. And Wait, so um, then he would jump with that on his back. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they jumped with the eighty one millimeters. Some of them did landing gliders, but I'm pretty sure they were able to jump with the eighty ones as well. I can find more info on that, but yeah, they. Paratroopers only fought with what they had with them. You know, wow. they would sometimes opt to not bring any food so that they could carry a couple extra clips of grand ammo. And uh, I, airborne doctrine usually states that 
paratroops need to be resupplied or reinforced within three days of landing or else you can say goodbye to your paratroops. And so it's really, they can fight with what they can jump with. And um, yeah, John D. Halls played in the 506 Regimental Basketball Team, which was first coached by the then first Lieutenant Dick Winters. He went on to become a major um, and the two were good buddies. And that's according to Winters' personal memoirs. You know, he remembered Halls well. Um, and Halls saw his first combat jump on D-Day, June 6th, and where Dick Winters landed. And uh, if you've seen that famous episode of Band of Brothers, they have days where they're going through the, tr- the trench at Braycourt Manor, taking out the row of the four German artillery guns, which were pounding the beach. Um, you'll see one character who uh, they describe in the show as John Hall from New York, and he's an A company, Able Company. And him and Garnier have a bit of like a tussle where Garnier just doesn't like him. He doesn't like the New York guy. He doesn't like that he's uh, um, from a different company and they don't know who he is. So they're kind of giving him a hard time. And he ends up proving himself and, and fighting well. And they grow to respect each other in the few hours of this little battle before uh, John D. Halls is actually killed on, on D-Day. And so, again, Banner Brothers and HBO portray him as John Hall. And he's from New York and A Company. All of this is incorrect. His name is John D. Halls. He's in uh, he was in the eighty one the heavy weapons more platoon, which was not A Company. And um, he was from Colorado, not New York. Big big part of it. Yeah. <laughs> there was another John Hall from New York in the five hundred six who was killed on the drop. His plane went down. He never made it out of his plane. And so there was another John Hall, and that's why this is important to clarify. You know for 20 years since 2001 when band of brothers came out people have been thinking like that's the john hall from easy company or whatever it's just wrong um but so yeah john hall was killed in the break manor charge and um i have here lieutenant winters on in his journal uh, while in normandy he wrote john d halls was with me on d-day he was killed charging for the third cannon out of four by an undisclosed machine gun nest he was a good basketball player and a good soldier um, and Halls was posthumously awarded the Bronze Star for his action on Great Corps that day. And um, Frederick Moose Heiliger, who commanded Easy Company for a short while before he was wounded by a friendly fire, um, he was one of his officers, and he, he wrote letters to Halls' mother notifying her what happened after the war. That's their relationship. And um, Moose wrote how Halls' heroic actions taking the battery on D-Day saved potentially hundreds or thousands of men or casualties uh, from the 4th Infantry Division, which was advancing off of Utah Beach, which is where the guns at Braycor were firing towards. So John, potentially, Private First Class Hall has potentially saved many lives just in his few hours of combat, and we need to remember that. Yeah, and not get it wrong, HBO. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> looking at you, Tom Hanks. <laughs> well, that's crazy. I I love that there's, you know, Hollywood does dramatize world war ii because i mean it tells the story right and i think they do a good job for the most part but you know it's hollywood and so i think it's it's awesome to come in and and just be like let's let's just make sure that honor and credit goes where it should right and the one when there was no internet like i have to search and they were going off of veteran and family testimonials spoken word memories people you know, these veterans are in their 80s, 90s. By the time they're recounting this to the writers of the show, there's, there's no way they could fact check this stuff. And uh, I, I can't blame them for, for certain errors like that. Do I wish they would come up with like an updated version of the show and like a little fix or even like a, a little note at the end of the credits on HBO's uh, streaming app? Yes. But that's why I write my stories. <laughs> well, maybe we'll, when we get enough listeners and enough uh street cred i guess then or big enough then they'll come and they'll see oh hey we should fix this well said well said and i can go in on band of brothers errors anytime you want <laughs> um wow that's awesome let's hear uh, a story about theater jo- uh, theodore t jones yeah this is another one that is unfortunately a little bit unfinished and this is a great example of where studying unit history can help writers paint a picture of what happened to an individual if there isn't certain information out there, which is a tactic that I rely on heavily in a lot of my writing. You know, the more of a historian you can be about a particular unit, and that's why I like to write about the airborne and a centralized type of unit, the the more you understand about that, the more your brain is going to be able to link facts that you see in passing late at night on the computer. 
And so um, let's talk about Theodore Jones. So he was an officer. He was the first lieutenant in the 326 Airborne Engineers. And uh, to be an engineer in the Airborne was definitely a special uh, a special job and a really demanding, tough job. Not only did you have to jump and fight with what you carry, but you had to remove obstacles, put obstacles into place, build bridges, make sure transportation could happen, make sure the flow of supplies could occur, worry about security and safety at the same time, in addition to just being a regular infantryman on the ground. So being a member of the 326 engineers was definitely, a, I consider them to be an elite unit. Lieutenant Jones, uh, known as Ted, uh, when he was growing up, he he's from Minnesota, and um, um, his family was a bunch of military guys. Uh, his brother served in the European Theater of Operations also during the war. He was in the Signal Corps, um, while his you know first Lieutenant Jones was a, was a paratrooper, and uh, he was known to be around six feet tall. I, I love finding their their height and weight on the draft guards like that. You know, he's six foot tall, one hundred fifty pounds, blue eyes. Um, Sorry, he graduated college just before the United States entered the war, and he enlisted in uh, U.S. Army Corps Engineers at just 23. So he's 23, volunteers for war knowingly, and he goes to be a tip of the spear to work as an engineer, um, which is something he happened to study. Theodore, was his, he was dating a woman before he, he enlisted and you know in his early 20s, and they were engaged after he enlisted while he was in training and whatnot. Um, and they waited to get married simply due to the riskiness of the whole situation, which was a letter. Uh, to, that was the words of his uh, former fiance, who had since married, and she's no longer with us. Um, but she's written letters about this, and there's some information from his fiance when he was young. So, yeah, he received his officer's commission, volunteered for the paratroops, and then took his experience with the Army Corps engineers into joining the 326 Airborne Engineer Battalion. Um, and so, um, yeah, he was able to meet his brother in England in February 1944, who was also in the Army, which I think was really cool. Um, they were able to see each other at one little reunion weekend in London on leave, and that's probably the last time they saw each other before they both went to their various bases and then into France. Um, and so, yeah, on, on June 6, 1944, he was leading either 1st or 3rd platoon of C Company in the 326, and he um, was likely the jump master in his stick. It was one of those stories where it's just landed in Normandy, killed in the vicinity of this small hamlet. And that's all that there is. There's no after action reports. Can't find any unique war graves commission investigation on him or like no primary sources to show where he went, what happened to him. I was able to locate a bit of information that, um, his helmet was recovered they found his helmet. They never found his body. Um, hem helmet was heavily damaged. They know it was his helmet because he was one of the few engineers in the vicinity of where he landed. And there's a big E, big capital white E on the airborne engineer's helmets. And it was the only engineer helmet there. And he was the only guy missing. Um, so what is speculated is um, his remains were not recoverable. You, you can understand what I mean by that. Um, due to the situation of combat and, and how he was killed. And so um, and that, that was just a really tough one where we couldn't find out what happened to him. Yeah, I'm sorry this one's a little dry. No, the, no, it's it's interesting because, like, there's a, lots of really cool stories, and then you come across the story where it's like, we don't really know. And no matter how hard we work, there's just nothing there, right? And so many of, of the stories, I feel like, are going to kind of come to that point just because the nature of record keeping, the nature well, of sir. war, you know, and everything yeah. like that. So I think, like, it's a telling the story of, you know, <coughs> of uh, Theodore Jones, does Theodore, uh, is, it's important for, like, people to understand. It's like, even though we don't know everything, like, we still have something that we can remember, right? You know, and, and the engineers, to me, that he was a college graduate. Like, he had so much going for him, right? Like, yeah. he was older, he had a, he had a fiancé, he, he was a college graduate, he had places to go, and, and he had already, you know, he was a little bit older, obviously not, not even really that old. He was um, 25 when he was killed, and he was a first lieutenant. So he was commanding, you know, possibly 50 or if not a few more men in combat as a 
green soldier. He had never seen combat yet. And, um, yeah, that's, he led multiple squads, if not an entire platoon of elitely trained paratroopers. At the time, he was 25, two years prior to where I am in age, and he gave his life fighting next to him, uh, which is, needs to be remembered. That is a, such a cool story. Um, another thing that like comes to my mind when I hear these kind of stories is like, sometimes I feel like in life, you, you think like everybody needs to know what happened but sometimes it's okay not knowing and being and and still be okay with what happened. Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, you know, kind of what I like to pull away from when I hear these stories of like, we just don't really know um, is like, it's, it's okay that we don't, people don't know what I'm doing right now. It's not like publicized in front of the world. Like everybody's doesn't, isn't watching me and it's okay because I know what I'm doing is what I want to be right. doing. Right. You know, and he enlisted. Exactly. So he wanted to be there. He was, he volunteered, like he wanted to be there. And, and exactly. And he was one of the few soldiers who was able to, he was potentially making a career out of the army or at least employing like his education into his role in the army where a lot of citizen soldiers, you know, a common term thrown around for men who were drafted or just enlisted everyday people in the war. Um, he was actually trying to, you know, leverage all the different parts of his life and be better at what he was doing. And it, it just really stinks that we lost so many people like that. I mean, it stinks that we lost anybody and both sides. It stinks that this whole conflict had to occur. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, luckily that's why we have us. I mean, situations like this where remains not recovered, hardly any info. We're lucky we have, you know, the American, uh, cemetery memorial in Colville, somewhere in, in Normandy, which has a great deal of both, you know, the walls of missing and remembrance, you know, names of guys who can't be buried there. And also the, the amount of Americans that are buried there are just really lucky to have a whole international system of formalized battle monuments and, and cemeteries like this. And uh, I'm happy that he is remembered there. Awesome. Well, I've really enjoyed hearing all these stories from you. It's been yeah. so much fun. <laughs> yeah. And I'm super excited about the content that was produced here. Um, should you have any advice to anybody who's listening to this podcast, thinking about volunteering, thinking about, you know, you know, getting involved somehow, what would you say to them? Yeah, I appreciate you asking me that. If you have some abstract interest in the second world war or just military history in general and you're looking to explore that pursue it just see what's what's going on with that interest of yours or if you've ever read a book or played a call of duty video game that you'd like to go a little bit further on stories behind the stars is absolutely an amazing opportunity for you one to research with tools that you otherwise would have to pay a lot of money to access which is a great great thing there's so many things you can learn from the tools that stories beyond the stars has provided me with just in terms of databases and and search engines um but it helps you contribute to that conversation so if you want to volunteer in your town you want to help veterans in some way this is the opportunity to contribute this is the opportunity to volunteer make a difference and what i will say is i work a full-time job i have a dog a family I, i do tons of stuff i do this in my free time and I can start and stop whenever I want. I've never felt any pressure from the project. I, I take it even further with helping in, in ways I can, you know, various videos or social media, or I like to review new uh, new writers' stories and help them on, on board to the project. Um, there's just so many ways you can help with a project that don't involve either research or writing and, and sitting down for many hours. It, it's totally at, at your own pace and at your own ability. So you, you can work at this at your own pace and whenever your free time allows. Yeah. That's what I love about it too. Cause it's like, you know, here's a name and you know, just start going when you can. Right. And yeah, that's a nice flexibility about it. But also like, I mean, I've had so many other researchers tell me that it's given them so much meaning to their life. Um, not that like, their life didn't have meaning before. I mean, yeah. not to say that we're meaningless in life, uh-huh. but it's it's given them more meaning and and more reason to get up and get going and wake up at five in the morning to to get something done. Like, yeah. um, and it's really give them a sense of fulfillment to to be a volunteer and 
and it hasn't just been like, you know, a lot of work that's drudgery. It's like, no, it's like purpose. Like, yeah. And one, one other little anecdote I'll, I'll give on that is, um, I, I've always had this passion interest in World War II, whether it's from Band of Brothers or video games, but nothing has ever made it feel like it's mine and like I'm actually contributing toward it. It was always just sort of like a, a nerdy abstract interest. Stories Behind the Stars has allowed me to be like an active participant in contemporary World War II history and the conversation that goes on today. And I, it, it's made it mine. It, it's made it one of my things, you know, and people know this about me and I'm a researcher and a genealogist in a very amateur sense. And it's a part of my identity now. And it's a new thing for me going into my late twenties or whatever. Um, it, it's just a new aspect of who I am in addition to my job or my dog. <laughs> and uh, it, I'm really lucky to have that. Wow. Thank you so much for taking your time today. It's been awesome to have you on here. Yeah. I really appreciate you talking on and and Don and your family. You guys are amazing. (laughs) Thank you very much. And uh, if Lawrence Hilton is listening to this, I'm grateful to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this content. Do us a huge favor. Find us on social media. We're on every platform, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, you name it, we're on there. Stories behind the stars. Follow us so you can see the postings we post, the stories we're finding. Share us with those you know. 